would open your Bibles to the book of Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. <coughs> Going to look at a single text from this particular chapter as our theme and springboard to our discussion this morning on how to cheat yourself of blessings. Lord willing, tomorrow I will start teaching a teen class at, uh, it's a miniature version of PTP, it's called PTP Spark. That's a kind of a, a really scaled down version of PTP and we have them at various places around the country. Had one at St. Louis at Arnold last year and uh, there's a little, going to be one at Midway in Jasper and uh, I'm going to be teaching from the book of Jeremiah. The whole theme is the book of Jeremiah and I've been assigned three texts from the book of Jeremiah to teach teenagers and this is one of the texts that I've been given on how to cheat yourself of blessings. And I thought, well, I'll, maybe I'll just take this sermon and practice it and run it by y'all before I run it by those youngsters tomorrow or whatever day it is I have uh, this particular lesson. But uh, my study of Jeremiah has been uh, uh, very beneficial, been very helpful and encouraging. And so looking at this particular verse, verse number 25, in verses 20 through 24, God is talking through the prophet about all the things that he wants to provide for his people. In particular, the early rain, the latter rain, and the harvest. And we understand even in our, you know, in our day that there are, there are periods of rain, early and latter rain, then followed by what we would call Indian summer, the time of harvest, where it generally stays dry for a pretty good, you know, pretty good spell. Unless, of course, we want to have a tent meeting and then it's going to rain every night. But uh, we, might ought to, we might ought to take some uh, contributions from area farmers. And anytime they need rain, we'll just schedule a tent meeting. And we'll, we'll drown them. <laughs> but, uh, but God is talking about, through the prophets, the good things that He wants to provide for His people. But He says in verse number 25, Your iniquities have turned these things away. And your sins have withheld good from you. In other words, Jeremiah says, God wants to give you good things. But you won't behave yourselves and let Him do it. He wants to bless you, but you won't let Him. And I want to think on your handout, it's not, look, this is not prosperity gospel foolishness to say that God wants to give us good things. Right? You know, prosperity gospel is God wants to make you rich. Prosperity gospel is God wants to make you healthy and rich. You know, all these, you know, all these foolish notions that cannot be found anywhere in the Bible. But that's a far different cry from saying God wants to give us good things. And so just kind of to, uh, to, to establish the case... In Deuteronomy 6, in verses 24 and 25, Moses said, God commanded us these statutes and judgments for our good always, that He might bless us. And so Moses preached to God's people that God wants to give them good things. And then it's even right to say that Jesus preached the same. It says uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, man, about verse 7, uh, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. For what man is there among you if his son will ask him for a fish, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a loaf or, or bread, give him a stone. If he asks for a fish, give him a serpent. It says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? So it's clear. The Bible text is clear. God wants to give us good things. But then beyond that, it's a, it's a fact. God already gives us good things. He already gives us good things. Man, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate Kyle's prayer this morning and the things that were contained in it, but to think about 
I mean, and I say it a lot, and people don't, they don't understand, they don't agree sometimes, but listen, I, I, I believe with every fiber of my being, we live in the best place on the planet. And I've lived other places, so I, I've, got some, I've got some means of comparison. I've been to other places around the world. You know, I've, got, I've got a pretty good comparison of, of, of this place as opposed to other places that I've lived and been, and this is as good a place I've ever been. You know, if it wasn't, I might not still be here. You know, I've lived other places. I left there. I left them, but I'm still here because this is a great place to live. It's a great congregation, a great, a great community. But it's an established fact that God already gives us good things. For example, in Acts 14 and verse 17, when these men are trying to make sacri offer sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas, it says... They, they, speaking of God, said He made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. Verse 17, Nevertheless, He did not leave Himself without witness, in that He did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. God gives us good things. About three or four chapters over, chapter 17 and verse number 25. God is not worshipped with men's hands as if He were needing anything, but gives to all life, breath, and all things. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God wants to give us good things God does give us good things, but there are cases where God would give us more good things if we would live in accordance to His Word. In other words, a lot of the good things that God wants to give us occur naturally when we follow His Word. You've heard me say this in, in other contexts, that there are certain things that are natural law that anybody can follow that are given to us by God and anybody that follows these, these natural laws will be blessed. For example, you know, you know, don't, you know, don't spend more than you make. You know, the, the, the writer said, a proverb says the, the, the borrower is the slave of the lender. Me and Kyle know that because we've heard Dave Ramsey say it a thousand times. The borrower is the slave of the lender. In other words, don't spend more than you make. When you do, it'll make life hard on you, unnecessarily. But you follow God's plan, it works. You know, a Ben Shapiro oftentimes talks about the things whereby almost every single person can avoid poverty and living in poverty. And one is finish high school. Number two is work a 40-hour a week job, regardless of where it is and, and what it pays. And don't have kids till after you're married. So if you'll follow those three things, it almost guarantees you'll never live in poverty in America. Well, aren't those things that God's already told us to do? I mean, now obviously God didn't tell us to finish high school, but He did tell us to work, and He did tell us how to, how to uh, arrange and, and conduct our family matters. So those, those are natural laws wherein God can and will bless anybody if they'll live within the confines of His Word. But when people fail to follow God's Word, then they cheat themselves of the blessings that God wants to give them. And I want us to think about four things whereby we can cheat ourselves out of blessings. And the one is right here in our text. Your sins have withheld good from you. Sin robs us of the blessings of God. Now, of course, I'm going to be delivering this sometime, Lord willing, this week to a group of young people. But it's still true no matter how old we are. Saturating our lives with sexual content or impurity robs us of the blessings of a purified and a pure life. How many, how many young people live in a 
live in a culture where their music is saturated with, with sexual content. Uh, their movies, their television, their on-screen viewing, their social media, everywhere they turn is filled with nothing but sexual impurity. They're saturated in sexual content and they have no real idea how to really live with other people. They can't even talk to one another. You know, they'll sit at table and text one another. But it's because their whole world is tied up, their whole world is tied up in social media, and social media is inundated with nothing but sexual saturation and impurity. Hebrews 13, 4 says, The marriage that marriage is honorable in all, and it's bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And again, speaking primarily to young people, they, they don't understand because society doesn't understand or appreciate it. The, the, value, the value of sexual intimacy in marriage. You know, why, do, why has God reserved those things for people that are married to one another? I'll tell you why. Because it's hard being married. It's difficult to be married. You know, what do you see on television? Oh, these two people, we're in love, you know, and, and, and everything is just going to be great 24-7. You know, and, and, and they got, they, and they're presenting an, a picture of the world and of relationships and sometimes of marriage that doesn't bear any resemblance to reality. You know, God, God gave sexual intimacy. One reason is to help people learn how to live one another. I don't care how in love, how in love you are with somebody, they got bad habits. They got things you don't like. They leave the toilet seat up. Yeah. They squeeze the toothpaste in the middle of the tube. They open the wrong end of the ice cream box. You know, you know, never, I never figured out why somebody opened the end of the ice cream box and then have to turn around and open the other end of the ice cream box. And then what's in the middle has to be shook out. Now fortunately, Rhonda's smart enough she don't open the wrong end of the ice cream box. She buys a tub of ice cream. <laughs> Married her because she's smart. Not just pretty, but also smart. But even during, and especially during, you know, they talk about, you know, your first year is honeymoon. That's, that's hogwash. It's hard to learn to live with other people, no matter how much you love them. And, and when you give things away, when you give things away that God has intended for marriage, you rob yourself of blessings. It's just, it's just the way, it's just the way that it is. And so that's just, and that's just one kind of sin that can rob us of, 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 of blessings. Uh, sin can cheat you out of the blessing of health. Sin can cheat you out of the blessing of life. You know, I can't tell you how many people I've seen, I, people I see that are my age and younger that are in nursing facilities because they've destroyed, they've destroyed themselves with drugs. Either they've, they, they've destroyed their brains with drugs or the use of drugs has caused them to have health issues, strokes, all types of... And I'm not saying everybody I know has had strokes because of drugs. What I'm telling you is I see people who are my age and younger who have robbed themselves of the blessing of health because of drugs and alcohol. They have become slaves to sin. You know, do, you think, do you think a person really wants to be addicted to drugs? You know, do you think that's what people want? And yet that's where they end up. And they've robbed themselves of the blessings of life. By the way, you can go to, you can go to our county jail website and you can see the people that's robbed themselves of the blessings of their freedom. You know, they, they don't get to just go anywhere they want, anytime they want. Why? Because th they've, they've caught themselves up in sin, and God wants us to be, He wants us to be a free people, right? I mean, He's given us liberties. He's, he's, he's given us the ability to live as a free people. That's what He wants, but people can throw that away 
because of sin. You can throw away your reputation because of sin. You can throw away your, 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 your name as, uh, because of sin. And you know, look, a good name and a good reputation is all but impossible to reclaim once it's given away. Writer of Proverbs said, A good name is rather, than, rather to be chosen than riches or gold. You know, I'd rather have a good name as a million dollars. As have a million dollars and have a bad name. Now I know some people don't care about their name. I understand that. But I'm not one of those people. I want a, I want a, I want a good name. And sin robs me of the... By the way, have you ever been blessed because you have a good name? Or a good reputation? Has anybody ever commended you or helped you out? Even maybe if they didn't know you because they knew that you, you were a good person, you had a good name, you had a good reputation. I expect everybody in this building has been blessed by having a good name. But you know what? Usually having a good name started with somebody before you. And then you inherit a good name and then it's up to you to preserve it. You know, where I grew up, I was in the middle. My mom's side of the family were people who had a great name in the community and in the church. And my dad's parents and my dad's brother had a good name in the community and in the church where they went. But my dad didn't have a good name. You know, and, I, and a lot of times I was behind the eight ball. You know, I'd go to school and I'd be behind the eight ball because some of my, some of my teachers were the same teachers my dad had. You know, and, and invariably, hey, did you know? And I, before they finish, I say, yeah, I know. You Joe Clifford's son? Yeah, did you? Yeah, I know. My dad called off school when he was a senior in high school. My dad did that. Called the radio station, TV station, canceled school, Dexter. <laughs> Somebody was asleep at the wheel at the TV station in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. He called and told him he was a superintendent. He canceled school. He did it. And he graduated in 1966. And I can go back to Dexter today and invariably somebody's going to bring it up. Go bring it up. Now, that's not necessarily having a bad name, but my dad did enough things for me to have a bad name on other, on other occasions. But sin can rob you of the blessing of a good name. Number two, what can I do to, to cheat myself out of blessings? I can forget God. In Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 32, Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Every married woman in this building knows exactly what she was wearing the day she married. Right? I mean, right down to every minute detail. My daughter has a perverse obsession with knowing what she wore at every single occasion she's ever been to. And I sat at a Red Lobster in Montgomery, Alabama with my daughter and some uh, kindly red-headed girl that's in this audience. Don't leave. And we sat at a table and they talked about what they had on at every single high school function they ever attended. Every one of them. Am I, am I telling the truth, doll? Am I telling the truth? Okay, I'm telling the truth. I don't know what it is about women and what they wear. I don't get it. You know, I might wear the same t-shirt four days in a row. Who knows? But God's people had forgotten Him. And He says, it's like a bride forgetting what she had on on her wedding day. And the Bible's filled with people who forgot God. You know, Moses warned the people of Israel before they went into the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 8, 
You're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to drink water out of wells you didn't dig. You're going to eat fruit out of vineyards you didn't plant and, 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 and orchards that you didn't plant. You're going to plant fields that you didn't clear. He said, I'm going to give it all to you. And said, and you, but you better be careful. When you get in there and you, and you eat and you got your belly full, you forget it was God that gave it to you. And you think that you had something to do with it. And just like Moses warned them, that's exactly what they did. They got in there and they got their belly full and they forgot God. Just like, a, a, just like nations do. You know, when America got rich is when America forgot God. And the richer we get, the more we forget about God. You know, you got Joshua chapter 8 after, uh, after Achan's sin and the fall of Jericho. Oh, Ai is just a little old city down there. Ah, we not, we're not going to carry nobody down there. We'll just care if you. We'll take care of them. We'll be back in time for supper. But they didn't consult the Lord. And 36 men died. They forgot God. Very next chapter, after they'd already been forbidden to make any treaties with anybody in the land, the Gibeonites came and deceived the children of Israel into signing a peace treaty with them. And here's what chapter 9 verse 14 says. But there was no counsel sought from the Lord. The Lord had already given them counsel. Don't sign any treaties. And all they had to do is ask the Lord, Lord, do we need to sign this treaty? And the Lord would say, no, those are Gibeonites. They're just on the other side of the hill. They're lying to you. Then those people end up being a thorn in their flesh. You know, we can read, uh, read Judges uh, 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 1 uh, through and, and 2 and read about how people forgot God. And we'll talk about that, that in another context in just a moment. Asa forgot God. Asa was a great king. God delivered him out of the hands of a million Ethiopians. A million Ethiopians came up to go against uh, uh, Asa as king. And God delivered them. The next chapter, chapter 15, 2 Chronicles, Asa begins to make incredible reforms among the people of Israel, going so far as to say, if you refuse to serve the Lord, we will put you to death. Make major reforms among the people. Next chapter, chapter 16, Asa has military trouble again and makes a contract with the Syrians. Makes a contract. Pays them off to protect him. So God sends his prophet down there and says, Have you forgotten what God did when there was a million Ethiopians at your back door? Why in the world are you taking the treasure out of the Lord's house and giving it to a pagan, unbelieving king to protect you when you know what God is capable of doing? And he threw that man in jail. And the Bible says he began to persecute the people for some time. He forgot God. And then he got a disease in his feet. Maybe he was a diabetic or something. We know people with diabetic that are diabetic have trouble with their feet. He was diseased in his feet. And the Bible says, And he consulted the physicians, but he would not consult the Lord, and he died. God wanted to bless Asa. God did bless Asa. But when Asa forgot the Lord, he cheated himself out of God's blessings. Number three, a lack of faith. A lack of faith robs or cheats us from God's blessings. God told Abram, I'm going to give you a son. Abram was 75 years old when that promise was made. He waited all he waited all of about 15 years and when he decided that God wasn't going to keep his promise, he decided to fix things. And boy did he ever fix them. Hagar and Ishmael. Ishmael, the father of the Muslim people. Think of all the blessings that people have been robbed of by the Muslims in the last 1,400 years. How many lives have been lost? How many people have been slaughtered at the hands of the Muslims for 1,400 years? Abram not only robbed himself of, of blessings, 
which first of all was a peaceful household. He brought another woman into his household. It destroyed, it destroyed his home life. It created a people that destroyed the lives of untold tens of millions through the course of history all because Abraham didn't have enough faith. Which is interesting because he's called the father of faith. Which even shows us that a man with a great, as great a faith as Abram still has feet of clay and can at times exhibit a lack of faith. What about Numbers 13 and 14 when the spies were sent into the land of Canaan to spy it out? And they came back and they said, Oh, the land is everything that God said it was, but there's giants over there. There's giants over there. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and we were like grasshoppers in their sight. We cannot take the land. And Joshua and Caleb said, we are well able to take it. But they convinced the people with their wicked, evil report. Listen, it hadn't been a year since they'd been delivered probably out of the land of Egypt. Probably not a year. Had they forgotten what happened in Egypt last year? Water to blood, flies, frogs, lice, disease, hail, death of the firstborn, crossing the sea, pillar of fire at night and pillar of smoke by day? I don't have any reason to believe that while they were denying the power of God, they did it in full view of that pillar of cloud. They forgot God. And everybody from 20 years old and up, was, they cheated themselves out of the blessing of the promised land. James said in James chapter 4, You have not because you ask not. He said, and the things that you do ask for are things that you, wanna, that you want to consume in your own lusts. You know, we need to be more diligent in the matter of prayer and thanksgiving and request. And the Bible says, in everything, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I've been trying to be more, more conscious of that in, in recent months and, and years. You know, I try to, and look, this sounds crazy, but I try to give God thanks for, for every good thing that happens to me. Every good thing that happens to me. You know, if, uh, if, if something had the potential to go sideways and it didn't go sideways, I thank God for that. If, uh, if something had the potential to be lost and it wasn't lost, I give God thanks for it. Let me give you an example of that. I was down in, on Detroit Hatley Road this last week doing a little beaver dam demolition. And I got done and I jumped in the truck and I'm rocking on down the road. I'm fixing to go home and I look around and I ain't got my cell phone. I'm like, oh. But the music was still playing on my radio. So I was pulled off the side of the road and I got out of the truck and there's my cell phone sitting on the side of the bed of my truck while I'm blasting on down the road. You know what I did? I thank God that I didn't have to go buy a new cell phone. Just the simple thing. You know, it's more than just being glad. Be thankful. The more, and the more we'll be thankful to God about those little things, the more mindful we'll be of God that He can help us handle the big things. Lack of faith, forgetting God. Then here's the last one. Lack of diligence. Lack of diligence can cheat us from the blessings of God. In Judges 1 verse 27, God had already told the children of Israel, drive out everybody out of the land of Canaan. Drive them all out. Guess what they failed to do? They didn't drive them all out. And the Bible is clear in Judges 1 and 2 and in other places in, uh, in the book of Judges that the people of Canaan were a thorn in the flesh of Israel all the days they were there. 
taught them how to practice idolatry and all, all other things that were contrary to the word and will of God. God wanted to bless them in the promised land beyond their wildest imaginations, but they failed to be diligent in driving out the Canaanites, and the Canaanites thus robbed them of their blessings. But they actually had robbed themselves. In 2 Kings 13, Joash is, is the king of Israel, and he goes to the man of God, and he says, he says, what am I going to do with the Syrians? He said, take some arrows, he said, and strike the ground. And the Bible says he struck the ground three times. And the prophet said, you should have struck it nine or ten times. He says, but because you've only struck it three times, you will only smite the Syrians three times, and you'll not do away with them. If you'd have struck it nine or ten times, you could have completely wiped them out. Failure in the matter of diligence. I want to close with three things very quickly about diligence. When I do not pour myself into my marriage, I cheat myself of God's blessings. When I don't put everything I can into my marriage, I'm cheating myself of the blessings that God wants to give me in my marriage. Add to this, given the choice of pouring yourself into your children or pouring yourself into your spouse, choose your spouse every time. When there comes a time when you've got to make a decision about whether you're going to devote all your attention to your kids or your attention to your spouse, choose your spouse every time. I can't name you a single couple, not one, that poured themselves into their marriage that are divorced. Where both of them poured themselves into their marriage and were diligent about their marriage that are divorced. But I know hundreds of good people who poured themselves into their kids and lost their marriage. The most important relationship that you have outside of your relationship with God is your relationship to your mate. And your kids are way yonder on down that list. Way yonder down. By comparison. By comparison. Lack of diligence in pouring yourself into your marriage will rob you of the blessings that God wants you to have in marriage. Failure to pour yourself and be diligent in your spiritual growth and development robs you of the blessings of spiritual growth and development. In other words, the more you invest in your spiritual growth and development, the more the Lord's going to bless you as His child. He's going to bless you with knowledge of the scriptures. He's going to bless you with wisdom. He's going to bless you. Uh, he's going to bless you with with, with uh, moderation in thinking and in life. Those are all tremendous blessings. But if we don't pour ourselves into the plan that God has for us, we we cheat ourselves of the blessings that are found therein. Lastly, this: when I don't pour myself into my worship. I cheat myself out of the blessings of worship. Look, I'm going to use a, a tired old illustration, all right? Y'all ready? It's a tired old illustration. Yeah. When people say, I didn't get much out of worship today, the proper response is, how much did you put into it? I've been hearing that since I was a kid. It's still true. People who pour themselves into their worship. People who sing, as we noted a few weeks ago, sing like Spirit-filled people. People who pray like Spirit-filled people. People that engage in the public proclamation of the Word like a Spirit-filled people. People who give of their means like Spirit-filled people ought to do. People that go to the cross every time we assemble around the table like Spirit-filled people do 
are blessed when they do that. And people who do not do that cheat themselves out of the blessings of, worship, of the worship of God. There are so many ways God wants to bless us. He wants to bless us. He's provided means, avenues, mediums through which He, he, can, he can bless our lives far beyond our, our wildest imagination. But we've got to follow His plan. We've got to follow His plan. You know, the greatest blessing ever been given to man is the blessing of the gift of Christ. It's the greatest blessing ever given. And it's given to every person who ever lived. The blood of Jesus Christ. And the blood of Jesus Christ is available to bless the lives of any person who will obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and be baptized for the remission of their sins. And then begin live, living a life wherein God will abundantly bless. But some have not availed themselves to that great blessing. They're cheating themselves. Christians who have not lived up to their calling are cheating themselves of great blessings. So we admonish and encourage everyone this morning, whatever you need to do to receive the blessings that God wants to give you, do whatever it takes today to be the recipient of the blessings that God has in store for you by obeying the gospel or by being restored to a proper relationship with God. If we can assist you in any way, we want you to come right now. So together we stand and sing this song together. Oh, now on.